All right. How's everybody doing today? Cool. <laughs> yeah, it's, it is a little chilly again. All right. Well, I'm glad you're here. So today we're going to start with a review of the transmitter. We'll go through this, the circuit for that um, briefly. And then we'll go on and we'll talk about our main topic, which is the receiver. So um, just like last time, we'll break the receiver circuit into stages and we'll talk about each stage to understand what's happening there. And then we'll see how the stages work together to create one overall circuit. How many more class times do we have to work on this three? Um, three, including today. Yep. Okay. okay. Yep. So we saw, okay. All right. We're on track for still doing transmitter though. Like if we're still doing transmitter, that's like... So we're reviewing the transmitter and we're moving on to the receiver. Okay. So if, you, if you're still working on the, the transmitter today, that's fine. Okay, okay. Yeah, if you're still soldering that together. Yeah, very few people finished soldering that together last time, and that's fine. Yeah, we have four classes all together, so that's about two classes per board. So, But yeah, we're just going to go over the receiver circuit today, um, just so that we know what's going on with that. And then... Um, just as a preview, the next class we'll talk about um, fiber optic cables um, and a little bit about fiber optic uh, data transmission. And then the final class, there won't really be any lecture. Um, it's just going to be an opportunity for you to finish up any, any um, remaining soldering that you have to do on your project. Okay. All right, so today we're going to talk a little bit about the receiver. We'll talk about the stages for that circuit. And then in the lab preview, we'll talk about assembly instructions for the, the receiver board. And then I'll also talk about a testing procedure that you will do for both your transmitter board and your receiver board um, once they are complete. This is very much like what would happen out in industry. Um, after a board is assembled, it's almost always tested to make sure that it works. So I'll show you a testing procedure for your boards. and. When you're all done, you can record the, um, the results of the test in your lab book, and then I'll sign that off, um, and that's how you'll get credit for your transmitter and receiver boards. So, also, um, there's no new homework for today, but please remember to keep working on the transmitter um, or the, the communicator homework in the lab book and also the communicator crossword in the lab book. So any questions before we get started? All right, so then let's start with a review of the transmitter circuit. So let's fire up the projector here. So before we dive into the circuit itself, I wanted to point out some of the information that's around this circuit. So down here in the bottom right-hand corner in particular is something called a title block. This is found on most circuit diagrams. This displays some additional information about the circuit. So it has the circuit name, the date when it was modified, um, the person who did it, and then maybe a file name for that uh, circuit as well. So. Um, most circuits in industry will have some sort of title block that goes along with them. Um, oh, and then the, the other key thing is that there's a revision number here. So this is revision 2.3. So oftentimes circuit boards will go through various iterations and changes. Um, and so you might have different versions of the transmitter circuit. We, we certainly have, um, I think that this is maybe the seventh or eighth um, design for the, the transmitter board here. So um, it's important if you're looking at a circuit diagram to make sure that you are looking at the diagram for the correct revision that you're on. So on your transmitter um, board, 
or on any circuit board really, there should be a revision number. So you can match that number to the revision number on your, um, your title block and then that'll make sure that you're looking at the correct diagram for the correct circuit. Okay. So this is the circuit for the transmitter. And we said that we don't look at the circuit as a whole because that can be overwhelming. Instead, we break it down into sections called stages. So we have four main stages here, the power stage, the input, the amplification, and the output stage. So we said the power stage provides the power for the whole circuit. And the way that it does that is that it draws the main power from this battery, which is a nine volt battery in our case. And then it has a switch to turn that power on and off. And then the wires from the battery and from the power stage run all along to the rest of the circuit. So the, the ground wire runs all the way along the bottom of the circuit here. The power wire runs all the way along the top of the circuit. So that distributes the ground and the power to all of the other components in the circuit, all the other sections that might need it. So that's how the power gets from the power stage to where it needs to go. In addition, in the power stage, we have this capacitor here. Anybody remember what this capacitor was used for? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It stores energy. It's like a reservoir. So we said that a battery can deliver large amounts of power, but it, it can be somewhat slow to deliver that sometimes. Um, it, a battery is not great at delivering quick bursts of energy. That's where this capacitor comes in. A capacitor can act like a reservoir and, and hold that energy, and it can deliver it very quickly. So if your circuit needs a quick burst of current, the, the uh, capacitor can supply that. So it helps to maintain this voltage at a constant level. Then in addition in the power stage, we had this LED and this resistor here. What was the purpose of the LED and the resistor? Yeah. Uh, in, uh, indi indicator light? Yeah, on. exactly, exactly. It just shows us when the power's on so we don't leave it on by accident and drain our battery. And then that resistor is the current limiting resistor so we don't uh, burn up our LED and we don't use too much of our battery on that. So that's the power stage. Any questions about that? Okay. All right. Then the next stage was our input stage. So the purpose of the input stage was to take um, an external stimulus, in this case sound, and turn it into an electrical signal. And the way that that works is that we've got a resistor and a microphone in series. And this microphone acts pretty much like a resistor itself. So what did we call a circuit that had two resistors in series, two or more? Voltage. Yeah, a voltage divider, exactly. So, um, and we, we call it that because it splits the voltage. So if this microphone voltage is about um, 20 kilo ohms when it's not receiving any sound, and this is 20 kilo ohms up there, then the voltage right in the middle here should be right about four and a half volts, half of, half of our uh, power supply. And then what happens is that when sound waves hit the microphone, it causes the microphone voltage or uh, resistance to change, go up and down, and that causes the voltage here to go up and down. So that's how we turn the sound signal into a voltage signal. And then the last part of the um, input stage is this capacitor. And we said that this capacitor, well, any capacitor allows high frequency signals to go through, but blocks out or absorbs low frequency signals. So this allows the high frequency sound signals that we care about to pass through that capacitor, but it blocks out any low frequency signals, like a constant voltage. So that, that allows one constant voltage over here and a different constant voltage over there, but it still transfers the high frequency <coughs> sound signals from, from the input to the amplifier. So any questions about the input stage? All right, and then the amplification stage 
just does what it says. It takes a small signal and it amplifies it, makes it bigger. Um, so again, we have a voltage divider over here, which sets a constant voltage on, on one terminal of this amplifier. And then we have our sound signal going into the other terminal. And the amplifier just makes, it looks at the difference between those two terminals and it makes it bigger. Okay, So um, it amplifies our sound signal. And the amount of amplification is determined by the resistor that we use up here in the, the capacitor. And then the other thing down here is this other switch. And that switch um, is the test mode switch. So if that switch is in one position, then this amplifier just works normally and it amplifies the incoming signal. But if we move that switch to the other position, then it creates a, um, an oscillation, which um, creates basically a high-pitched uh, screechy sound, which sounds awful, but it can actually be useful for testing out our circuit. It creates a large signal that should be easy to see at um, this test point there. So any questions about the amplification stage? Yeah. Um, so, so basically what happens is that when we have the, um, the switch in the closed position like this, then um, the, the amplifier starts to charge up this capacitor and it, it keeps on charging it until um, the, the capacitor gets to a certain level and then um, that causes this um, this voltage to, to flip around and then it starts to discharge that capacitor. And the capacitor discharges all the way down um, until it gets low enough and then um, this voltage flips around and then it starts charging up again. So it's this charging and discharging of this capacitor right there is what's going on. But when the switch is in the open position, then there, it's, that capacitor is not connected to anything and that um, oscillation doesn't occur. Yeah. Other questions? All right. And then finally, we get to the output stage. And this output stage takes our electrical signal and turns it into another type of signal that leaves the board. In this case, it's turning it into a light signal that will shine down the fiber optic cable. So the way that this happens is that we've got this sound signal going into this transistor. And the transistor acts like a, a variable resistor or you could think of it like a dimmer switch. Up here we've got the, the LED, and we've got this transistor down here. So when there's more resistance, you have less current flowing through the LED, and so you get less light, and vice versa. Less resistance means more light from the LED. So that's how this transistor controls the amount of light that's coming from the LED. So it's turning this um, variable sound signal into a variable light signal. And then that shines down the fiber optic cable and goes to our receiver. So any questions about the output there? Um, and one other thing I wanted to, to point out, this is for, these are the stages for a fiber optic audio transmitter. But these are, these same types of stages would be found in um, almost any type of transmitter, whether it's a radio transmitter or um, a transmitter for you know, TV signals, um, a transmitter for internet signals, you'd have the same basic stages in any of those types of transmitters. All of them would have some type of power supply. All of them would take some type of input. Um, they would almost certainly amplify that input to make it large enough to do something useful. And then they would have some type of output stage. So these same principles apply in many different types of transmitters. Now, the components within each stage might be a little bit different. If you're talking about you know, a little handheld radio, um, the, the output would probably be an antenna. 
um, but it would still have a, a power supply probably coming from a battery, it would still have a microphone input, it would still have an amplifier. Um, if you're talking about uh, a broadcast radio, like that sits up on top of one of the hills and, and broadcasts a giant FM signal for you know, hundreds of miles around, then the power supply is gonna be you know, some giant um, thing fed by the power lines from PG&E and you know, the input is gonna be a little bit different, but this, it's gonna have the same basic stages. So by learning about these, um, this transmitter, you're really learning about the basic principles that are involved in any kinds of transmitter. Okay? And the same thing goes for the receiver. We're gonna be talking about a fiber optic audio receiver, but the same basic stages would be found in almost any kind of receiver out there. Okay? So these, these lessons apply across various fields. So any questions about the, the transmitter before we move on? Okay, all right, then let's go on and talk a little bit about the receiver. Okay, so this is the receiver. You can see it has a title block as well. Um, the revision number on the receiver board is 2.2, it's not the same as the revision number on the transmitter board. So um, it's, it's just something to note if you're looking at, at the title block there. So let's talk a little bit about the, the receiver circuit. So the receiver circuit actually has five stages, whereas the transmitter only had four. So the receiver has this extra stage, this filtering stage. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But it, it also shares the power, input, amplification, and output stages um, that we had on the transmitter board, okay? So the power is uh, almost identical to the power stage that we had on the transmitter board. It's got the battery, the capacitor to stabilize the voltage, switch to turn it on and off, and then the indicator light. The input stage is a little bit different. Now, for the receiver, what do you think is gonna be the input? What sort of signal is it gonna be sensing? Fiber optic. Yeah, the, the fiber, it's gonna be getting a signal from the fiber optic cable, and what is it, what's actually gonna be coming down that fiber optic cable? Light. Light, exactly. So the input stage needs to have a light sensor. And that's what this is up here. So that symbol looks kind of like the, the symbol for the component that we had in the output stage on the transmitter. Anybody remember what that, that um, component was called? Yeah, a transistor, exactly. So this is a transistor. But remember the last one had three wires going into it. This one only has two wires, but now it's got these two little arrows going in. And those arrows look almost like the arrows that come out of uh, an LED. So they symbolize light. So this is a transistor that is controlled by light. We call this a phototransistor. Photo meaning light. So, so this is a, a phototransistor. It receives the light from the, um, the fiber optic cable, and then it changes its resistance based on how much light is hitting that transistor. And then down here we have a, another resistor. Now this, this is, looks kind of like a normal resistor, but it's got this third wire attached right in the middle of that. Anybody know or guess what um, type of component that might be? Yeah. yeah, it is a potentiometer. That's exactly right. So I brought along a potentiometer to just refresh our memory. This is, this is what a potentiometer looks like. This is a big one. Um, the ones we have on our board are much smaller, but the principle is the same. There's a big resistor that goes from one side to the other, and then there's this, this wiper that 
that moves back and forth on that uh, resistor. So that's what is shown here. There's this big resistor part here, um, and then there's this middle wiper that can move up and down on that resistor. Now, let's, let's think about what signal we would have um, at various points along this resistor. So um, if we move this wiper all the way down to the bottom of the resistor, uh, essentially that wire would be connected to ground. So what voltage would we have on that wire there? Well, what voltage do we have at ground? Zero. So if the wire is connected to ground, remember there's the same, a constant voltage along any wire. So if we have zero volts at ground, we'd have zero volts on that wire. So that voltage would be zero and it wouldn't change if the wiper was all the way down here. Now, up here, um, when, when this, when different amounts of light hit this um, phototransistor, we've got a, a voltage divider here. So, so that's gonna create a varying voltage at this point. So, um, and that, that voltage is gonna be in the, the, so, the same sort of uh, shape as our sound signal. So, um, so this, if we move the wire all the way up to the top here, we'd get our uh, full sound signal. Okay, so if we move the wire all the way down, we get nothing, um, and we move it all the way up, we get the full sound signal. And if we move it partway in between, if we moved it, say, to the middle, we'd get half of our sound signal. The lower down we get, the, the smaller the signal gets, the higher up, the bigger the signal gets. So, so what would be a common name for this type of adjustment? Volume. volume, exactly, exactly. This is the volume knob, okay? You turn it one way, you get uh, a bigger signal, higher volume, you turn it the other way, you get less volume, okay? So, so this potentiometer is our volume knob. So then this signal goes out to our amplifier. Now, um, again, the amplification is done primarily by one chip. In this case, um, this, tip, this chip is labeled 386. This is a, a 386 amplifier, and it's specifically designed for audio purposes. So um, it, it creates a relatively large um, output that can feed a speaker. The chip that we had on our transmitter um, amplifies the, vol the, the voltage, but it does not amplify the current. So that chip would not provide enough current to, to drive a speaker. But this one is specifically designed to have enough current output to actually drive a speaker. So that's why we use this type of chip on this circuit. So we have that, again, we have this capacitor between our input stage and our amplification stage that allows the high frequency signals to go through, but it blocks the low frequency signals. Does yeah. It amplify voltage as well? Yes, it amplifies both voltage and current. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and again, the the amplification, the amount of amplification, um, is determined by this. Um, capacitor and any resistors that we might put in the path there. Um, so in this case, the amplification is about uh, 200 times. So the voltage going out would be about 200 times bigger than the voltage coming in. So that's the amplification stage. Any questions about that? Okay. Um, and I want to skip over the filter stage for just a minute. We'll come back to that very soon, but right now I want to go on to the output stage. So the output stage is labeled LS1, that stands, stands for loudspeaker one. So this is just our speaker. So this is the thing that takes our electrical signal and turns it into sound. So let me just briefly describe how a speaker works electrically. Um, so basically what you have is 
you've got kind of a, a metal frame for the speaker. And then the, there's some sort of a, um, a plastic membrane that, that is flexible. And then in the middle, you've got the, the speaker part. Now, let's take a step back and, and talk about what, what sound is for just a second. So sound is really just changes in air pressure, okay? So if we wanna create sound, we need to create those changes in air pressure. And the way that we're gonna do that with a speaker is that we, we cause um, the membrane on the speaker to move back and forth. When it moves out, it creates a high pressure wave. When it moves back, it creates a low pressure wave. So we need to make the speaker move back and forth like this in order to create sound. So the way that we make the speaker move is that we do it with magnetics. Um, so <coughs> behind this speaker, there is a permanent magnet And that permanent magnet has a north pole there, say, and a south pole there. And there, there's wires going to a coil that is on the face of that speaker. If we were looking at this from the front, the, uh, the speaker would look like this. And the coil would come in here and it would coil around and then go off like that. And then the permanent magnet would be right behind this coil of wire. So what happens is that when we put electricity through the coil of wire, what does that coil of wire become? Electromagnet. Electromagnet, exactly. So when we push electricity through that coil in one direction, that coil gets attracted to this permanent magnet and it pulls the the speaker back and creates low pressure when we push the electricity through that coil in the opposite direction the coil um, becomes repelled by the magnet and it pushes the speaker out and creates a high pressure wave so by changing the direction of this current we can make the speaker move back and forth and create these pressure waves which are sound so that's how speakers work and that's how we create sound. So that's what's going on here. When our sound signal um, goes, in, um, goes up, say, it pushes the uh, speaker out, for instance, and then that creates high pressure. When our sound signal goes, voltage goes down, it um, pulls the speaker back in and it creates a low pressure wave, okay? So, so that's how the speaker works. So any questions about that? All right, now let's go back to our filtering stage. So a filter in general terms is something that allows certain things to pass through, but blocks out or absorbs other things. So this is true of any type of filter. An air filter allows clean air to pass through, but it blocks out or absorbs dust and uh, dirt and debris. Water filter allows clean water to go through, blocks out um, impurities. An electronic filter allows certain frequencies to pass through, but blocks out or absorbs other frequencies. So, um, so up here we have a capacitor in series with our, our signal, and we said that capacitors allow high frequencies to pass through, but they block out or absorb <coughs> low frequencies. So that capacitor allows high frequencies to go through it and reach the, the output. So if we were to look at a graph of frequencies here, um, or sorry, this would be the amplitude
And over here would be frequency. This, this capacitor would allow high frequencies to go through it, but it would block out or absorb lower frequencies. So um, if you looked at which frequencies would go through, you'd see the high frequencies going through. So we call this, um, this capacitor in that position a high pass filter because it allows high frequencies to go through. Now, over here, we have a, another capacitor um, that is going from our signal and going down to ground. And it's got this, this resistor there also. So this is allowing um, certain high frequencies to go down to ground. So the, the important thing about the, the filter is kind of where it starts to attenuate signals. So we call that the cutoff frequency. So this is where the filter starts to attenuate signals? Yeah, the cutoff frequency is where the filter starts to attenuate signals. So, so this capacitor up here is a, is a high pass filter and it has um, a relatively low cutoff frequency so that it, it um, still allows some things to go through. Um, the, this, this capacitor down here is allowing the high frequencies to go to ground. So um, that, we call that a low pass filter. So that allows low frequency signals to go through to our output, but it, it cuts off or um, attenuates high frequencies. So that is a low pass filter. And, and that cutoff frequency is, is up here. So when we, when we put these two different filters together, what we get is something that allows just the frequencies in the middle to go through. So it, it allows these frequencies in, in the middle here to pass through and get to our output. So together, we call that type of filter a band pass filter because it only allows this middle band of, fil of frequencies to go through. So when you put a high pass filter and a low pass filter together, you end up with this band pass filter, okay? So the, the reason that we don't have, uh, we don't want super high frequencies to go through is because um, there could be like radio frequencies and things like that and, and they could be making that speaker move and we wouldn't be able to hear it. Um, and so we'd be using a bunch of power um, for signals that we can't even hear, so they're useless. So, so we just um, cut those out and absorb them so that they don't go to the speaker. Now, um, why, why might we want to not have really low frequency signals going to that speaker? Remember, low frequency signals, the lowest frequency would be a constant voltage, like three volts or five volts. Why would we not want that type of signal going to this speaker? 
Well, yeah, it wouldn't, it wouldn't make any noise. But, and what, what would it do if we just had a five volt um, signal across this, this speaker here? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's one thing. Yeah, it would it would create a constant um, signal here, and if it was big enough, it could yeah stick the speaker to the mag to, yeah to the permanent magnet, and it, it wouldn't be able to move anywhere. So that'd be really bad because then you wouldn't be able to hear the the sound that you did want. Um, also, this this is, speaker is essentially just a wire, and so it's if you tried to put a five volt difference across that, essentially you'd have a short circuit. And that wire would heat up really fast and it could damage the speaker and it would also drain your battery really fast. So, so we can't have a constant voltage across a wire um, because yeah, it would just, it'd be bad. So, so for all of those reasons, we want to avoid um, the lowest frequency signals which are just constant voltages. So that's why we have this filter, which um, or both of those filters, the high frequency, high pass filter and the low pass filter, and we put them together to create this band pass filter there. Okay. So any questions about that? Yeah. So what values of uh, capacitor and resistor? Um, so, so we'll talk more about filters in a later lecture, but um, there, there is a formula that involves the resistance and the capacitance. Um, and when you know the resistance and capacitance, you can um, put them into this formula to find the cutoff frequency. Yeah. And you can choose the cutoff frequency based on your application. So in this case, we're talking about audio, so you would have cutoff frequencies based on the range of human hearing. So you would choose, so human hearing goes from about 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. Um, so you could use those for, for cutoff frequencies. Um, if, you're, if your output was going to a radio antenna, then you would want to have cutoff frequencies that were that allowed your desired radio signal to, to exit, but blocked out any signals around that that you were not trying to transmit. So, yeah. So, so these are the basic stages for our receiver. Again, these are the same basic stages that you would have for almost any type of receiver that you were working on. Um, so are there any questions about any of these stages? All right, so then let's go on and um, let's do our lab preview. All right, so Okay, so let's go back to the um, instructions here. So let's just briefly review the, the general assembly tips. So you always wanna wear your safety glasses. Um, you wanna solder the resistors in first. Um, and then you can line up the resistor color codes. Like I said, the tolerance band goes on the right for horizontal resistors and it goes on the bottom for vertical resistors. That's just an aesthetic choice to make things look better. Electrolytic capacitors are polarized, so make sure you put them in, in the right direction. Um, you can use tape to hold components in place. Make sure you solder the socket into your board and not the chip so that you can change out that chip if you need to. And then line up the battery terminals and make sure that you're using the correct terminal in the correct place. Now, let's go on and talk about the receiver instructions here. So 
Um, for the receiver, you're going to you're going to put the 386 chip into your board. Remember, the 386 is the audio amplifier, so that's the one we're going to use in the receiver. You're going to use the black fiber optic holder in the receiver. So. Um, So, where did it go? So, all right. So the that's that's this piece up here. So you're going to use the the black um, receiver that has the the photo transistor inside of it that's designed to receive the light from the um, the fiber optic cable. Remember when you put the 386 chip in the board, you want to line, line up the little divot on your um, socket with the little mark on the silk screen and then line up the little, the little circle and the divot on your chip with the, the um, little divot on the uh, socket. So make sure those are all lined up so that everything's in the correct orientation. And then there are capacitor codes for the um, capacitors for the receiver as well. Okay. So those are the basic instructions for assembling the receiver. Any questions about that? All right. Then I also wanted to talk briefly about how we're going to test the boards. So when you have finished soldering your boards, you will, you're actually going to test them out to make sure that they work. So let me show you how we're going to do that. We're going to start with the, the transmitter board. And when um, we're looking at the transmitter, um, we're going to do two things. So first of all, we're going to look at the test signal and make sure that we can see that. And then after that, you're going to look at your, the sound of your voice and see what the sound of your own voice looks like on the oscilloscope. And then you're going to sketch that in your lab book. And I'll sign that off and that'll be the, um, how you get credit for the, um, the fiber optic transmitter. So, so let's take a look back at the transmitter circuit for just a minute. So here is the, the transmitter circuit. What we want to do is we want to look at the signal that's coming from the output of our transmitter. So, um, so the um, the output from the um, the transmitter is right here going to this this um, this LED, and you can see right at this point we have this little pin that's labeled TP6 for test point six. So so this is a little test point. This is a a spot on your board where we can actually hook up an instrument to do some testing. So let's look at the board itself. So if we look at the board, you can see that all along the top, there are these, um, these little circles labeled TP1 through TP6. So those are the test points that we can use for, for examining the circuit at different spots along, um, or, or examining the signal at different points in the circuit, okay? So the big one over on the left is labeled TP1 ground. So that's where we're gonna hook up our ground signal. So we're gonna take our um, ground lead from an oscilloscope, and we're gonna clip that right here onto the ground point on the board. So that's where we're going to get ground. And then we said that the signal for the output 
is connected to test point six. So we're going to take our lead from our oscilloscope and pull back the little collar around there and hook that right on to the point where it says TP6. So that's how we're going to connect to our circuit board to measure that signal. And then we're going to turn the board on and we're going to turn this little switch down here at the bottom. We're going to take that switch and put it into the uh, testing position. And that's going to create that test, test signal for us. So we're going to move that over to the test position. And then we can look at um, the signal on the oscilloscope. So let's switch this around here. Flash. All right. So, so this is the signal on the oscilloscope. Right now, um, it looks like there's nothing there. So we need to um, we need to kind of adjust our oscilloscope view so that we can actually see that signal. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in in the vertical direction. So that we can do that with this knob here. So I'm going to turn that knob and start zooming in in the vertical direction. And now I can start to see some, uh, some signal there. So then the next thing I can do is I can start to zoom in in the horizontal direction. And now I can, I can see more of a, a signal. So it's not a, a really pretty signal, but, um, but there's a, a signal there. So that is our, that's our test tone signal, okay? So then um, once I can see that test tone signal, I'm gonna come back to my board and I'm gonna switch it so that it's not in test mode anymore. Now it's in regular mode, okay? So now, um, let's see. So now I can, um, in regular mode, um, what I notice is that when I'm zoomed way in, I don't see any signal. So I have to zoom way out. And now, now I can see kind of a, a signal up here. This is a line. But when I try and zoom in on that signal, um, the line just gets higher and higher. And if I zoom in too much, that, that line basically goes off the top of the screen. So what's happening is I'm zooming in right at, at the zero level, um, or at the level of zero on my screen, but, but now my voltage signal is so high that I, I can't even see it anymore. So what's happening is that that, that signal basically has a, a, a constant voltage and a a little tiny wiggle, which is the sound signal. We don't really care exactly what that constant voltage is, but we are very interested in that little wiggle because that's the, the sound signal that we care about. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to be able to zoom in on that, that little um, wiggle without having that, that constant voltage in the way. Fortunately, our oscilloscope has a function that will allow us to do that, and that's called the coupling. So right now, up here, it's in DC coupling, and that means that it shows us the signal exactly the way that it is. So it shows us the, the wiggle, which is the AC part of the signal, um, and it shows us the constant voltage, which is the DC part of the signal. But I can change this coupling. If I change it to 
If I push that button, it changes to AC coupling. Now you can see that that line drifted down and now it's centered right around the middle. Because what this is doing is that it's only showing us the AC part of the signal, the little wiggle that we care about. It's getting rid of that DC constant voltage. So it's just moving that, that um, signal down to zero as if there was no constant voltage. Okay? So, we, so that AC signal does that for us. AC coupling does that. And now when we zoom in, you'll notice that signal stays on the screen because it's right at zero. So I can zoom way in on the signal. And now you can see when I'm talking, it changes the, the signal on the screen. Okay? So right now, we're only seeing a very short length of time uh, for our signal. What I'd like to see is I'd like to see my voice uh, displayed over a longer period of time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom out in the horizontal direction. So I'm going to use this horizontal scale knob over here on the far right. And I'm going to turn that counterclockwise to zoom out. And that's going to start showing us a longer period of time. So, so here I am. Now we're down to two and a half seconds per division. So now if I talk into my, my microphone, you can see my voice showing up on the screen. So you're going to do that, and you're going to get a print of your own voice. And then you're going to come up here to the top right corner of the screen, and you're going to push Run Stop. And that's going to stop. That's going to pause the oscilloscope and freeze your signal on the screen there. And then you're going to draw that picture in your lab book. You're going to draw a picture of your own voice in your lab book. It doesn't have to be exact, OK? But you know, do your best try and sketch your, what your voice looks like. You can sketch that in your lab book, and then that will be the sign-off page for your fiber optic transmitter. OK? So any questions about that? All right. And then we're going to do a similar thing for the receiver. Um, with the receiver, though, we're just going to sketch the test tone. OK? So um, on the receiver, we're again going to look at the output, but now this is going to be at test point five here. So, all right, so let's move back and look at our receiver. So, this is the receiver board. Um, so again, you can see oh, I got it all down. you can see that um, there are the test points along the top of the board. Test point one is labeled over there. That's ground again. So we're going to connect the ground lead to the ground test point there, and then we're going to connect our um, our oscilloscope lead, our probe to test point five there. So I'm going to turn this on. Now when I turn this on, um, yeah, they're close together. And I'm going to put this in um, test mode to create that signal. And that's going to make that horrible screeching noise. Um, so you want to have things kind of set up so that you don't have to listen to that screeching noise for too long. So I'm going to uh, run this. We can we can zoom in here again. Oh, so right now, yeah, you can see the sound of my voice on the screen. So that's actually much bigger than it was even on the um, on the transmitter. But yeah, you can see the sound of my voice there. And then when I put this in test mode, yeah, it makes that horrible noise. So we can zoom in in the horizontal direction, zoom out there, stop that, and then turn it off so that it doesn't have to do that anymore. Um, and then that's, you'll sketch a signal kind of like that in your lab book for your receiver. Okay? 
So that's how you'll get credit for your receiver. So any questions about the testing? All right, then I will take attendance and then I'll let you go.